Hello guys into the new lecture. First of all, I'd like to thank to sponsor of this video. It's Jorge from Brazil. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for asking to make this video and hopefully you're gonna enjoy in this one. I'd also like to thank to my student Tolga from Turkey who helped me with some ideas and to work out some of these main things because he's been using this opening for so long with good results. Hillbilly Attack is very funny uh, opening, very funny line, a very tricky line against Karakan players. Uh, Karakan players are extremely uh, tough to crack players, positional guys, guys who like solid games. Well, this is everything what Hillbilly Attack is not. So we just want to go for a crazy initiative. We just like to sack the pawn uh, for the sake of attack initiative and all the time some sort of compensation. It's very similar to the Grand Prix attack. So that's why many of you might like it. Uh, regarding uh, the range and the level, well, you can use this. Anyone can use it in Blitz, in Rapid Chess, you can use it in tournament chess if you're a lower rated guy or medium level. I don't think that this should be an opening for high games, even though I occasionally saw some 2600 guys playing this in some very important games. So let's get started. Hillbilly attack, e4, c6, and when they play that tough Karakan, you just go with bishop c4. Absolutely makes no sense, I'd agree with you. Uh, because they anyways want to go with d5 and kick this bishop away with tempo. So in this lecture, I'll try to uh, present more like most important ideas and tricks of this opening rather than showing you like some uh, model games, uh, most important uh, and uh, I don't know, some artificial games by some, some of these players. No we're just gonna work out the main ideas and I'll try to uh, give you like the um, definitely insights on how this opening and tricks should work. So you go back with bishop b3 and for the first time you sack the pawn on e4 and we'll see that's the main line and most of your opponents will take on e4 but what's gonna happen if they go with either knight f6 where they don't want to take the pawn and they just play kind of Karakan kind of French or if they go with e6 which also makes sense since they try to by placing pawns on the light squares uh, create a weak light square bishop and b3. It doesn't change anything in our plan whether they go e6 or knight f6 we go with the same setup. So we go with uh, d4 and if they once again go knight f6 just like in previous knight f6 where we go with e5 immediately so uh, you just go and we just transpose into the same type of game. So you play d4, they go knight f6, you always kick this knight away with tempo. The tempo here is very important and that's something that we care very much about. So we kick this knight away, typical French idea, and um, now we go with flexible c3. What I like about the following position is that we haven't committed ourselves with the knight on g1 so it's still not placed on f3 that's a good thing because that knight is gonna go on e2 well a knight from d uh, b1 where d2 is gonna eventually end up in most of these games on f3 securing and giving better protection on the d4 pawn so after c5 this is the point this is the point and i insist on this move 92 so much after knight c6 castles for example uh, majority of these guys uh, with the black pieces they go b5 or they go bishop e7 on bishop e7 you can go with the classic plan knight uh, knight d2 followed by knight f3 and then decide whether you want to place your knight from e2 on f4 or g3 and another thing if they play b5 we have a specialty for example here everyone who used to play this variation they used to go with knight d2, knight f3, and those classic ideas. 
I believe that I came up with a very nice improvement and it's knight on f4. It's a known idea from some whenever French positions. Your knight goes on f4 and it actually goes towards h5 once the dark square bishop from f8 leaves control of the center. Here that's not gonna even be a possibility for black. So why? After knight f4, let's say they go a5. Let's just say they go with all these uh, massive pawn storms on the, the queen side. You go rook e1. You place your rook into the center of the board, give support to the uh, pawn peak and the peak of your pawn chain. And let me show you just how tricky this position is. For example, um, ever since um, um, uh, my student asked me to make this video, uh, I said, okay, let me just try it out a little bit on my hidden accounts. And it went very interesting. Uh, I, I very much enjoy these uh, creative positions. Also, I like when I play something uh, completely, you know, like fresh and out of nowhere because I'm pretty, I'm pretty creative in these uh, circumstances and these situations. So let me just show you what happened here. After rookie one, for example, most logical move and what uh, weak players always close the center. That's weak. And that they, then they even improve position of the light square bishop that goes on, e2, on c2 and we anyways want to attack on the king side. For example, lots of guys played bishop e7. Believe it or not, that loses. You sack your knight on d5. Can you believe it? And when they take, you go here. And whether they play bishop b 7 or knight db8, you just go with the queen f3. What a nice and very easy way of winning two pawns in the center, breaking everything, and simply black is about to collapse. About rookie one, I mean, apart from uh, rookie one, bishop e7, they can also go knight b6. Now, I especially like my knight f4 novelty because you can take on c5, and now bishop is here. It looks like you've just activated the bishop with tempo, but actually that's not a case. I'll show you one a blitz game of mine. Fide master was black, knight h5. I'm threatening g7. The guy played castles and it loses on the spot. Uh, queen g4. I don't know. I mean, he, he made a severe blunder, probably made the uh, uh, castle maybe even pre moved. So g6, knight f6, and if king h8, queen h4. If this one, I had faster mate. Queen h4 is, leads to mate, but I played attractive bishop h6. And uh, if he takes queen h4, followed by queen h7, checkmate. But what's the point? The point was, once you play rook e1, and once you play uh, knight f4, you actually wait for the bishop to move. If the bishop moves, now you just go with that knight e5, bishop d5, followed by queen f3 idea, going after, uh, going after f7, pawn and c6 knight, uh, with the queen and the bishop. And the thing is, uh, apart from this, uh, if they go with knight b6, you just take, uh, remove bishop as a defender from the king side, and then you just go with this uh, very strong knight h5 move. Problem is that they can't play castle, they can't play g6, uh, they uh, probably have to put the bishop back, and that's just so terrible. They're just so terrible because you even have queen g4, and uh, they can't play this because of check. But even this check is debatable. My position is so good that I'm not sure that I want to, just for the sake of exchange, uh, give you a strong center or give you some certain counter chances because you have strong center and four minor pieces. Maybe I just want to play normal like bishop g5 and stuff like that. So this is one thing. And finally, if rook e1, and for example, they take on d4, they take on d4 and now play bishop e7, basically changes nothing because of this very important tricky knight e5. Uh, so I like this position so much. On the other hand, absolutely the same thing happens if they play knight f6. You kick the knight away, you support the pawn on e5, you play knight e2, you give the flexibility to the pawn chain with c3, and afterwards, when they go knight c6, you go castles, followed by knight f4 and rook e1, and with absolutely same ideas. I just want to show you one more uh, thing when they decide not to take on e4. So when we play d4, and now if they decide to take, now we won't have that early queen h5 trick 
you know how how much I'm fond of all these queen h5 moves in white e4 openings. So here you don't have it, but what are you going to do? You just go knight c3, knight f6, and I'll show you an interesting game by international master from Serbia, Maksimovic, who played the following game like a couple months ago. He played f3. And okay, looks like uh, Raider Gambit or like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the Gambit is, uh, when you play d4, d5, e4, where you just sack the pawn and you just go for a better activity for the rest of the game. And this guy, his opponent played bishop b4. It's an IM from Finland. Uh, this guy played f takes c4. Absolutely doesn't look logical. And after knight e4, look at this. Knight in the center, pinned knight, weak king, threatens queen h4. And believe it or not, white is great. You, uh, Boyan, played queen f3 he threatened the knight on e4 he threatened the knight on e4 defended on c3 and threatens this knight at the moment um, this Finnish guy played knight c3 b takes c3 and went for this very tempting queen d4 move I like it if you take you can't take the queen and if you take the bishop he's gonna take the rook but knight e2 played a one at attack the queen and threatens bishop. He has to play queen e5. White played bishop f4. If you move your queen anywhere but f6, you're about to lose the bishop. His opponent played queen f6 and probably forgot about one uh, pretty uh, unusual trick. Bishop takes b8. And now you just, by exchanging queens, you're going to eventually uh, take on b4. So he won this game in 12 moves. The game was played on chess.com entitled Tuesday. Very nice one. On the other hand, I tried to analyze what what's going to happen if they don't take on c3, but immediately uh, go with queen d4. Nothing. You play the same knight g2. You play the same bishop f4. You have to play queen f5. You play g4 and you go with h4. With four minor pieces being developed, queen here, possibility to make castle afterwards, uh, to chase this queen away, uh, for the rest of the game. I believe that this this gives us not only a great compensation, but a great winning chances afterwards. So this is what I like about Hillbilly Attack. And uh, this really uh, looks attempting to try in faster time controls, you have to admit. And after Bishop to b3, I just want to tell you one more thing. I've seen some guys play d5. Here I give you an option of going into my course, Bishop's opening, Knight f3. And if they go knight f6, you can play bulletproof variation with d3 or objectively a tiny bit better according to the engines, knight c3. But that's your choice. And in, in any case, white is just better and has like more perspective game. And now let's go to the main lines. So when you play bishop b3, they just take on e4. And now we go with my most favorite move. It's queen h5. It's queen h5, you of course threaten to take on f7. They have two options, g6 or e6. Way more common in practice is g6. Let's take a look at e6. If they go e6, uh, when they play e6, they just close the activity of the bishop on b3. Makes sense, but at the same time, they just close the activity of their light square bishop. We go with knight c3, they go with knight f6. Here, I have two suggestions for you. You can bring your queen back on e2 and capture afterwards or play f3 followed by knight takes f3. That's an option. So you sack the pawn or you just decide to take on e4 and to carry on that position playing like that. Magnus Carlsen and Firuzia, they both try this uh, hillbilly attack and they both played queen h4. Queen h4 is interesting because uh, queen immediately takes pretty attacking square and getting ready for mating attacks. Here you, have, you just need to be creative, you just need to be good at attacking and you just need to like and to enjoy attacks very much. So when you play queen h4, they just have to go bishop e7 or knight bd7. In my opinion, knight bd7 is more solid for black simply because when you take, 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 Knight c5, they win the bishop pair. It's not of a great 
um, importance to keep the light square bishop that hits on the pawn on e6 anyways and that is kind of limited but I just have to say that probably of all the positions that you're going to see in this video this one is probably the most solid approach for black players whether you bring your knight uh, sorry queen back on e3 or e2 uh, they will take but I also have to say that I don't see any problems for white in this position. A file is ours. I can always consider bringing my rook into the attack with rook g4, rook a4, transferring that uh, rook onto the king's side uh, over the fourth rank. Or if bishop is seven, knight f3, and when they go castles, d4. More or less normal position. Let's be honest. They have a healthy pawn structure, bishop pair. We have a tiny bit better game um with development they have the bishop here so i'd assess this position as roughly equal with roughly equal chances and it's quite interesting on the other hand after e6 knight c3 knight f6 queen h4 i expect that majority of your guys uh, will play bishop e7 simply it's a very tempting move and for example if i played a game with black pieces probably i would go with bishop e7 as well then you take on e4, knight takes, queen takes, knight e7. You develop your pawn, you care about the center, and they play knight f6. And here it's white to move. In all those games, I found that uh, white brought their queen back to d3. It's nice to keep an eye on the queen, and then you just play knight f3, castles, bishop g5, and uh, probably put your rooks on the e file and another rook on d1, d5 normal development what i don't like about this position is position of the queen on d3 i want more attacking position for that queen so i came up with something new for you here it's queen to e5 it's very interesting queen on e5 first of all they can never go with any retreating knight d7 or exchanging knight d5 followed by bishop g5 in some positions or knight e5 to harass your queen that stands on h4 so that's one thing another thing is uh, that when I play queen e5, I can easily slide it over onto the king's side and into the, into the attack with queen g3. So when they go castles, we go knight f3. I like this knight f3. We just continue developing ourselves. And now they have c5 or b6. If they go b6, take a look at this one. A great plan. You do castle, bishop b7. You b br bring your queen back uh, here and threaten bishop h6. Uh, watch this out. This is my uh, game against American IM, pretty high rated guy, two days ago. I played queen g3, the guy played c5, everything looks cool. My bishop on b3 is at the same time strong piece that attacks on e6, but at the same time weak piece because it's pretty limited. I played bishop h6, look how he tricked him. He played knight e8, defended on g7. I took on c5 and opened the d-file and I'm preparing myself to do it with tempo. Looks like he now made a crucial uh, mistake by playing queen um, e7. Probably something else was better. Uh, what, what was the problem? I, I was very happy with this game because look at how my pieces just slide onto the uh, black skin. So I played castle and from this point onwards, I just made all the aggressive attacking moves look at this queen g3 that's the point of queen e5 that's why i like it if the queen was on d3 we wouldn't have this possibility bishop h6 it's not that i'm threatening mate i'm not expecting to give him mate but i'm actually opening up the back rank and both of my rooks will go on their ideal places rook a1 goes to d1 rook f1 goes to e1 so he went 98 i capture I'm opening the d-file, so when I bring my rook on d1, it should be with tempo. So I played rook d1, and he played queen e7. And here, I played knight e5. And to be honest with you, I saw that I wanted to play rook d7 or knight d7. Uh, and saw that after rook to d8, uh, there must be something. And then something crossed my mind. Uh, I you know, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to play rook f to e1 originally, to even pre-move that move. But then I realized if I play that, he's going to play rook d1, rook d1, and maybe he can, I don't know, parry out my threats with some, for example, bishop d6. And then I said, wait a sec, what's going to happen if I play bishop g5? Can he play f6? Uh-huh, no, not. 
because if f6, I'm gonna take here. And if he takes, I take on e6. And after this, I give check this one, and this is checkmate. So I said, aha, okay, okay, it doesn't work. But wait a sec, if he goes back with the knight on f6, I have a crushing attack. And all of, he resigned at this point. All of a sudden, it's a very interesting moment of the game. Uh, take a look at this, this three pieces. Everything thanks to the queen that was on e5 that I brought back on g3 into the action on the king side. I like it very much. Uh, if they, on the other hand, play c5, immediately c5, so instead of b6, nothing. You just go castles, you go rook to d1, and depending on circumstances in the game. I just want to remind you one positional thing here. Uh, for example, bishop d7, you just play knight d4, and you have typically better position, typical for, for Karakan, for French. Uh, you have three against two. This is also typical for Sicilian Alapin positions. Three against two, pawn majority for white. You always can play bishop f4, c3, bishop c2, but you always can also consider exchanging queens because you have three against two on the queen side. It's nice. Uh, on the other hand, bishop d6, it gives us good game because we now threaten this bishop. And when they offer us to exchange queens, yes, I'm willing. I'm more than happy to trade the queens off because I got a pawn majority. And you know when the queens are off, pawn majority is even better. But I don't want to do that just like that. Let it be. I'm going to, uh, of course, develop my bishop and give you possibility to trade the queens off. If not, I developed another piece. So you see, even though we all know that it's good to exchange queens, you don't do it in the way that he's going to benefit from that. But you actually continue uh, with uh, your logical development and uh, then let it be if you want to take on d4 i'm fine with it and uh vice versa so just like you see all these positions are pretty nice for us and the specialty most of these games they will go g6 here i had a great help of tolga who explained me all these ideas a couple months ago and it didn't pay attention and uh, i told him if you hire a professional coach, we got to learn something really, uh, you know, like one of the main lines. And I really mean that. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep this line to play it occasionally just for fun or in faster time controls. So bring the queen back on h4. Threaten the pawn on e4. They go knight f6, you go knight c3. Here, I believe that most of your opponents will play bishop g7. Those who want to keep the pawn, they will play bishop f5. But this position can transpose also from bishop g7. You go f3. Here you sack the pawn. Knight f3. And when they play castle, you go d4. If they go now, for example, bishop f5. So be absolutely aware of the fact that those positions can arise even from uh, this order of moves. So let's just go back once again to early bishop f5, where black just tries to keep the pawn on e4 and to be so happy. Nothing. This is why I told you in the beginning of this lecture, this is like Grand Prix attack. So what do we do? We play f3. We don't care about the material, by, uh, but by fast pawn sack, we just want to organize our actions on the open f, e, and d files. After bishop g7, I go d4. Why early d4? Because sometimes I'm afraid of some c5, knight, c6 by then. So that's why I usually play d4 early. They go castles. For example, knight bd7 early, you play castle, castle, bishop h6. Take a look at this one. Um, next move most likely will be knight g5, all together with the bishop and b3, all together with bishop h6, queen h4, and open f file. This is nothing else but a typical Grand Prix attack. And I like it so much. For example, if they go rook e8, just trying to re retreat with the bishop and to avoid attack, you go knight g5, threaten f7, e6, and you go h3. Usually, when they play e6 and g6, you go with h3 and g4 plan to trap this bishop. In order to do that, don't forget one thing. King is on g1, pawn on d4 could be weak. Always make sure to either put your king on h1 or even better, involve your rook into the action. So put it on d1, defend the pawn on d4, and then go with h3 and g4, uh, trapping up the light square bishop on f5. Another thing is if they go knight b6. I've seen this in so many games. You go knight g5. Once again, they go e6. Aha! Uh -huh. Once again, you closed and 
pretty much trapped your own bishop. I'll go h3. I won't do g4 before I make sure that I defend my pawn on d4 by rook a d1, and then I'm going to go with g4. They go bishop h6. I'll show you something nice. Engines, for example, very much uh, like material, and they like this position for black. But they just at first glance. When you go a little bit deeper, it goes completely differently. They're up to pawns. I'm actually very grateful to my opponent that he took on d4 because he just put my king into safety. For example, rook ad8 is a logical move, but it's stupid because they lose rook ad1. And wherever they put the queen, you just take here, you just give check, and when they go here, move your bishop back and they can't stop knight f7 with devastating consequences. That's one thing. Another thing is, what am I going to do in this position? Nothing else but rook to f3 and, uh, for example, rook to, I don't know, rook a to f1, uh, knight, uh, sorry. So th this arrow, I don't want to confuse you. So uh, rook a to d1 or rook a to f1. Uh, in some positions, a rook... Uh, h3, uh, for example, if you double your rooks on the FL, you threaten rook h3, bishop h3, rook f6, followed by queen h7 mate. Just like I said in the beginning of this lecture, you need to be very creative and to like to attack and to be good at it in order to play these positions successfully. I enjoy them so much. Uh, if castle, that's not a big deal. You just go with castle. And let's take a look at a whole bunch of possibilities for black. For example, from my own experience and from what I analyzed in these games, I realized that absolutely the best here is h5. h5 because it stops our main ideas with bishop h6 and knight g5 for the time being. Let me just show you something. For example, one guy played knight d5 to close the, the activity of this bishop, but then you give me an easy g4. g4 is good. Because once you move the bishop, we have knight g5, threatening mate. You can't play h5. That's another good benefit, um, a great benefit of g4 pawn. They got to go here, and now you go back. And now look at this. h6 is hanging. And if they go e6, very common here or in grand prix positions. Boom. Boom. Bishop g5. What's so special? They can't take. And now you once again benefit from having the open f file. If they go here, queen h7, rook f7, checkmate. If they go knight f6, you just sack your rook and deliver checkmate on h7. What a great trick. Apart from that, they can go with knight a6. Knight a6 makes sense because this knight uh, keeps the queen open and queen keeps pressuring d4 pawn. Knight can go on before a knight can go to c7 and e6 eventually or d5. If knight a6, let me show you a correspondence game. Bishop h6. And now I believe that the most logical thing here should be rook a to e1. This guy in correspondence game played bishop g7, played rook a to e1, played h3 to kick this bishop away, did it finally, and after bishop d7 played knight e5. After h6, knight c4, took on e7, and here after knight e5, knight e7, queen e7, this guy couldn't defend. First of all, he couldn't move the bishop as a defender. Second thing, he couldn't defend f7 and resign the game. Game was played in England back to 1993. I also want to show you one more uh, thing to be aware of. For example, in these positions, uh, if they go with h5, that h5 is probably the most elastic defensive resource for black. Now you gotta uh, definitely uh, change your plans and you have to adjust your plan. Previously you wanted to go bishop h6 and knight g5 and now you can do it but what are we going to do? We're gonna play h3 so if you ever move knight from f6 I'll have g4 and if knight bd7 for example I go knight g5. Why? Because after e6, I have this fantastic g4. Uh, I very much enjoy these positions. Uh, when the knight is on d7, I always believe it's a worse version of uh, hillbilly attack for us. Because knight on d7, it stops queen from attacking d4. Now d4 is safe. So I don't think that the knight... Be the, and it's going to happen in most of your games. Be absolutely sure about that. 
So you play knight g5. Why? Nobody understands. Probably they think like this guy wants to take, maybe he wants to sack on f5. No, I want to go for this. So if you take, take. You can't take by knight, it's checkmate. If you take by bishop, I go this one. Now I'm threatening. Knight f6, knight f6, rook f6, followed by queen h7 mate. They have two options. If bishop h5, look at this crazy tactics. All our minor pieces and two heavy pieces uh, participate in the attack. <laughs> there is one weird thing. It's the king on g1. Look at this. King is in the middle of, I can't say nowhere. It's on its typical square uh, g1, but there is no defense and there are no pawns and guardians of this king. But doesn't matter, you don't need them. Knight f7. You now rely on tactics. Bishop e6, followed by knight g5, and they can hardly defend this position, even according to top engines, this is winning for white. Another thing, they go bishop f5. Aha, uh -huh. you want to defend yourself. You want to say you're solid. Not this time, babe. Rook f5. If e takes f5, knight d6, and you threaten on f7, and he collapses. G takes f5, you just go knight d6, threatening bishop f6, bishop f4, king h1, rook g1, or king f2, rook h1, but more importantly, knight f7, followed by uh, bishop e6, or knight e6, bishop e6, with an immediate mating threat. Nice attacks. And finally, if they play bishop g7, if they just say, okay, this guy wants to sack, uh, let me just get a pawn back and complete my development, will say, we won't do that. We won't let you play normal game. So we play f3. They take, we take. If they play e3, play knight g on e2. I like this. I saw that the ginger GM, uh, thanks to whom we can uh, say that this uh, this uh, variation got on its popularity. He, uh, he played one game, d takes e3. It's okay, but I believe knight g on e2 is a little bit better because if you play takes bishop takes castles long castle and you have nice initiative if they go short castle now you can take because you have to simply otherwise you have you cannot castle you gotta go castles uh, e4 and position like this you have an open a file you have this typical bishop h6 ideas or bishop e3 rook f to d1 why it is a little bit better and finally, let's take a look what happens when they take, take, play castles, and you play once again d4 before a castle, so they can't play c5. I showed you what happens on this whole bunch of games with bishop f5, castles, and then you just go with bishop h6 and knight g5. And I explained the ideas. The only thing when, when you do the h3 is when they play early e6, where they trap the light square bishop in the middle of the board. If instead of bishop f5, they go knight bd7, what I expect to be seen in many games. You just go castle, c5, and here, yes, you can go with bishop h6, but here you just have to support the center as well. I like this center support. They can play e5, they can do anything. They gotta do b6 to develop, rook a b1, and now you have knight g5. And once again, they have terrible uh, problems with all these things, and when they go like h5, knight f7, go home and learn to play hillbilly attack so it's very nice one then you play bishop f6 and so on and you just get a lot of material back uh, they can play like this early bishop g4 what i expect by many guys because it looks like they're uncovering the defense sorry covering the defense of the queen h4 and d4 uh, it's not a big deal you just play castle because they cannot touch the d4 pawn since the knight on f3 is uh, defending. And on the other hand, lots of guys think it's good to give up this bishop for the knight so they won't be able to go with bishop h6, knight g5. Well, that's kind of true, but we go bishop h6 and after e6 we go rook to e1. For example, I'm very interested in sacking at some point here, in going with this rook on h3 at some point, in involving another piece like bishop g5 or knight e4, uh, White has a nice activity here, and for sure, he's got a very good attacking prospects afterwards. Uh, I just want to tell you one thing, uh, one more thing. Uh, for example, lots of these guys, when they play knight bd7 and you play castles, uh, they might play very passive. I showed you c5, but let's say they go b6, and you go bishop h6, and they go bishop g7, and you go knight g5. And lots of these guys 
might think that, I don't know, they can go with c5. Can you recognize the tactics for white? You take on g7, you take on f7, and they collapse because they can't stop knight e6 with a fork to the queen and the king. Another very common and very useful trick. Uh, finally, that's why I'm saying knight on a6 is definitely better because the queen actively attacks the pawn d4. You go castles, knight e7, this is another thing. This knight can go on d5, this knight can support bishop e6 to oppose our bishop and can go to e6 if it needs to oppose bishop or knight on g5. You play bishop h6, they offer you to exchange, you play knight g5. This is typical Grand Prix attack. For example, let me show you another thing. Now you threaten famous Grand Prix trick. Bishop h6, rook f6, queen h7 mate. Uh, they they take here. You don't have time for that. You got a capture and they go knight c on e8. Looks like they just defend everything. And not that it looks like. They do defend. But don't forget, guys. We're only down a pawn. So king goes on h1 to put it in safety, not to blunder any check. Now, when they take on h6, we're going to gladly take. And when they take on d4, it's going to be our turn. Only move could be queen d7. And then... Maybe if they want to parry out your attack with queen g4, you just now go positionally. Rook a to e1 going after the e7 pawn. And then they have problems with queen g4 because any transposition into middle game like this is favorable for white. So they go knight d6. The most typical Grand Prix and hillbilly uh, uh, attacking idea comes, to, uh, comes, comes right now. So take a look at this. Bishop g7 rook f6 and funny funny thing is if they take by king you just go with rook f1 and it's mate uh you can go with knight c on e4 and it's mate uh but if they take by pawn it's queen h7 mate but if they play h6 looks like they're going they're about to take either rook or knight no you just play rook f7 and once again the same trick with the knight e6 uh, fork since the king is on g7 and queen on d8 uh, so once again this trick appears on the board hope that you enjoyed this hillbilly attack presentation and uh, hopefully you're gonna have much more uh, success uh, than uh, i don't know uh, most of these top guys who use this opening do but this is a great thing this is a great thing and uh, I really am really looking forward to hear your uh, feedback, opinion, and of course, share your games with us. Uh, finally, uh, subscribe, follow the channel, and support. Bye-bye.